Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear respected brothers and sisters. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on the auspicious birth anniversary of Hazrat Ma'suma alayhi salam on tonight's program. We are once again joined by Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani for our weekly show live in London with Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani. We'd like to take this opportunity on this auspicious day to also announce that Imam Hussein Media Group will be growing their projects with an Urdu channel, inshallah, which will be called Imam Hussein TV4, and further information will be released on this soon. Sayyidna, tonight's topic, Assalamu alaikum, by the way, wa apologies. Wa tonight's topic is the greatest woman in Islam. Now, having researched into this topic, looking into various narrations, one oft uh, narrated narration that keeps coming up within Sunni and Shia ahadith is that Anas reports that the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, The best women of mankind are four. Maryam, daughter of Imran, Asiya, wife of Pharaoh, Khadija, daughter of Khawailid, and Fatima, the daughter of the Messenger of Allah. Now I wonder, for the Prophet to reply with such an answer, someone must have asked him who are the greatest women within Islam. So what's the wisdom behind asking such a question? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and congratulations to the whole Muslim community on these nights, the first nights of the Qa'da, which normally people honor the birth of Sayyidah Ma'suma alayhi salam. Yes, it's a, it's a poignant question because it's a narration, as you mentioned quite rightly, that's often heard in many of our congregations that the four women of paradise are these great women that have been mentioned. Sometimes a person wonders why would the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family single out four women or say four women are greater than others? Because I've heard many times in our communities people saying, why do we make a distinction who's greater than who? These are all great personalities who gave different sacrifices towards the growth of the religion of Islam or in their different ways showed wonderful submission towards their Lord. So what's the point of us, for example, discussing or saying one's greater than the other, or as you said, the title of tonight's discussion, the greatest woman in Islam. I think if you look within the Holy Quran, you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not shy away from making it clear that there were many great prophets but there's one who stands out from all of them. Mm. There are many great prophets, but they're not the same as the messengers. There are many great messengers, but they're not the same as the arch messengers, the ulul azm. If you look in the Quran, the word tafdil or fadlna, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, we have given honor and made to excel some prophets ahead of others. I don't think there's a single Muslim in the world who will deny that there are some prophets who are seen as being higher than others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say anything except that there is a wisdom behind it. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why do you need to tell me that, for example, Ibrahim, and Musa, Isa, Nuh, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why do you need to tell me they're greater than everybody else? They're all great prophets. But Allah says, no. فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضُ النَّبِيِّنَ عَنْ بَعْضُ That we have given excellence to some of our prophets ahead of others, some of our messengers ahead of others. Even the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is higher than the rest of the Ulul Azm. The rest of the Ulul Azm are all of the Muslimin. But the Holy Prophet is awwal al-Muslimin, the first to have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah talks about the rest, he says, they are all of those who submitted. But the first to have submitted is the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Likewise, we therefore find that even sometimes in our communities when there's a debate, who's greater, the prophets or the imams, for example. You find some people saying, well, what's the need? Who cares if Imam Ali, for example, is greater than Nabi Nuh? or he's not greater, what difference will it make? No, the trend in the Quran is that there are certain personalities who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided deserve a particular level 
of recognition and have received a certain level of grace that may be higher than others. I found some theologians, for example, saying that there are prophets of God in the Quran who may perform tarqi awla. Many times you hear tarqi awla is that where a prophet may perform the recommended, the good, but not the recommended. But they say the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family would never. He'd always perform that which is recommended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these four women in particular are seen as the greatest four in Islam, if someone says, what's the point of saying, you know, one's greater than the other? No, there is. Because foundations of belief are built around this. You imagine if Allah tells you of a certain lady who's the greatest, that means that that lady, whoever angers her, is far from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That lady, whoever causes grief for her, is nowhere near the teachings of God. It's not just a matter of Rasulullah saying, you know what, the Sayyidat Nisa of the heavens are Asiya and Khadija and Maryam and Fatima and that's it. No, he's giving a message to his community. That Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, for example, or Sayyida Khadija, for example, whoever's at war with them is at war with me. So such a hadith is a very important hadith. It's not just a matter of a person glossing over it. And that's why all the schools of Islam narrated, not just us. You mentioned that Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, which between them have thousands of narrations, which between them are seen as canonical works in early Islam, make it clear that there are many women, but these four are the greatest. And in the same way Allah made certain prophets excel above others. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain of the woman of this world excel above others. So I noticed tonight obviously is the birth of Hazrat Ma'suma alayhi salam and she is not on that list. Does that mean that list is, is only, only the four on that list are the greatest or are there other women within Islam who we can emulate to be more like or learn lessons from? Well, the religion of Islam has produced and has seen some of the greatest women you'll ever find in the history of humanity. Because you don't make it in the list of Ibrahim, Nuh, Musa, Isa, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa doesn't mean you're not a, a, a great prophet. Of course. Doesn't mean you weren't a Luqman of your time or a Talut. Mm. Talut is a king for his people. Luqman is a saint for his people in the sense of the wisdom that he has. Mm. Doesn't mean Asif bin Barkhiya, the Wasi of Sulaiman, was not a great person. He's bringing a, a throne of the Queen of Sheba next to you. Mm. But those four excel. But that's not to deny that there weren't great women in this religion who may not have made the list of that four. But believe you me, the amount of devotion they had towards their Lord is something impeccable. I remember Sheikh al Saduq, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his soul, has a work, the Khisal, it's a renowned work. And you know, within the Khisal, there are certain genres of literature where some chapters are, are, are named after numbers. So, you know, if, if, if a chapter is named after seven, it means the seven, the hadiths of seven. Mm. The sev those who were the best in their patience are seven. Those who were uh, the following seven is what ensures you get into heaven, you know? So mm. there's a particular chapter in Saduq's Khisal. Ayatollah al khoi may Allah bless his soul, gives this narration a sahih isnad, extremely strong. Says that there are seven great women. Now, your hadith that you brought up said the greatest. The greatest. This hadith mentions seven great women. When this hadith mentions these seven great women, I don't think many of the speakers in our community have even discussed or given biographies of these seven. Many would have discussed Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam. Many would have discussed, for example, Maryam alayhi salam. Many would have discussed Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. But I don't think many would have discussed, for example, Asma bint Umayyad. You see, I'm going to bring names of people Muslims all agree upon. I don't want to bring names of people 
some Muslims will revere, others will differ, mm. or people who cause headaches for every Muslim. So these seven Muslims, these seven great women, and notice something, Ahlul Bayt many times in their, in their traditions, whenever they give a piece of advice to their followers, they don't say, and the men of our nation should be like this. For example, mm -hmm. Rahimallahu man ahya amrana, doesn't say that Allah has placed mercy on the men who revive our affair. No. Rahimallahu man, men here could be men or women. Correct? Ahlul Bayt wanted to make clear for all of us that the women in our community and the men in our community, all of them, can achieve the highest of levels. Here in this tradition, Asma bint Umayyis is mentioned. Salama is mentioned. I ask you, say Jabir, Salama, who is she? Was she the servant of Fatima to Zahra? It's a good try. And I won't ask you a question again because it's unfair for me to put you in such a position. <laughs> but let's say someone like Salama, the wife, let's say, for example, Salama, the wife of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. Think of Fizza, sorry. Say the Fidda is another great mm. woman. Even I remember in that list, Sheikh al Saduq mentions the mother of Khalid ibn al Walid as being seen as one of the greatest women. Yet no one has, for example, read her biography. Yes, Walid ibn al Mughira is a nightmare. But his wife, that's an interesting discussion. Why have the Imams of Ahl al Bayt mentioned Asma ibn Umayyis? We know. Salama we know, Maymuna we know. There's another lady who's mentioned by the name of Hamida. There's another lady from Banu Thaqif who is known as the wife of a man by the name of Hajjaj. Not necessarily Hajjaj bin Yusuf, but another of the Hajjaj. Now, these women, and another one is Um Fadl, the wife of Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu Now, when you're seeing these great women being mentioned, when we're saying that the four greatest women are Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima, alayhi salam. We're not discounting the other greats. We didn't mention Sayyidah Zainab, alayhi salam. We didn't mention Sayyidah Fidda, as you rightly mentioned. We didn't mention Sumayya, mother of Ammar bin Yasser. We didn't mention Um Ayman, for example. There are others that we didn't mention, such as Sosan, such as Tuktam, Narjis. We haven't even mentioned, for example, the ladies of the 10th of Muharram. Mm. Daylam, the wife of Zuhair ibn al qayn Layla, the wife of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Um Ishaq, the daughter of Talha. All of these we haven't mentioned. Um, um al Banin. Um al Banin, the mother of Abel Fadl and his brother. So, I don't want to say that because we're mentioning these four, there weren't other greats. But like the Quran says, there were some messengers we made to excel above others. Likewise, there are some women who were made to excel above others in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So out of these four greatest women of mankind, are there, is there one in particular that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors more so? That the Prophet would have narrated, you are the chieftain of the women of heavens? Well, I, I would say if you're looking in her time, then Maryam, the mother of Jesus, was without a doubt, according to the Quran, in her time, say that Nisa al Alameen. Because many times people say to me that when it says, Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala Nisa al Alameen, when it says this, many times people ask me that clearly it shows that Maryam, the mother of Jesus, is the greatest woman to have ever lived in the history of humanity according mm -hmm. to the religion of Islam. Because mm -hmm. we know Mary in, uh, in the Quran is mentioned more than Mary is mentioned in the Bible. Yes. And Mary has a whole chapter after her in the Holy Quran. Mm. And in chapter 3 verse 42, the angels say, Oh Mary, God's chosen you, purified you, chosen you to also be the greatest of the woman of your time. Now here's the point. Maryam was the greatest of the woman of her time. No one can deny that. While she was living, there was no one greater. Hamza was the master of the martyrs when he was living. Mm. That doesn't mean that the accolade remains with them forever. There may be someone else Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses later on who takes that accolade. If I were to ask you, Hamza was Sayyid al-Shuhada? Yes, he was. When he died in the Battle of Uhud. When Karbala happened, who became Sayyid al-Shuhada? Abu Abdullah. Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam. Maryam was the Sayyid al-Nisa al-Alameen when Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam came. 
all the attributes Allah has given Maryam is given to Fatima alayhi salam. If the angel Jibra'il spoke to Maryam, he also spoke to Fatima. Both of them are what are known. A muhaddatha is the one who the angel has spoken to. Has spoken to. Muhaddath may be the male who an angel communicates with. Not with revelation, mind you. Yes, Rasulullah receives revelation from an angel. If the Imams of Ahlul Bayt speak to an angel, that's not revelation. But they are muhaddath. And likewise, Fatima Zahra, like Maryam, Allah, when he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the angels make it clear, Inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki. God has chosen you and purified you. Purification here is mentioned as quite a general purification. With Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, it's not a inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki, inna ma yureed. There's a complete difference in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses this thorough purification of Al-Muhammad, that everything imaginable that we can ever think of in terms of impurity, Allah says don't even imagine it with Al-Muhammad alayhi salam. It wasn't just a, say, a case of in Allah astafa Adam, yes, we've read that in the Quran. In Allah astafa Nuh, we've read that in the Quran. In Allah astafa Al Ibrahim, we've read that in the Quran. With Ayat al Tatheer, Inna Allah liyudhu ankum al-Ridz ahl al-Bayt wa yatahirakum tatheera. Allah subhanahu wa taala has gone even to an extent, even the Arabic of the Inna Ma at the beginning to try and highlight that there's a particular point that is being given towards. Al Muhammad, there's a particular grace that's being given towards them, and there's a thorough purification, and that all impurities can never reach Al Muhammad. The discussion of the purity of Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein with Rasulullah is completely different to the discussion of the purity of Fatima Zahra of Sayyidah Maryam. Fatima Zahra, there's a narration where Imam al Sadiq mentions that when Fatima Zahra discusses her position as Sayyidina Sal Alameen. She asks, but Maryam was Sayyidina Sal Alameen. And the reply that comes to her is, but you are Sayyidina Sal Alameen for the first and the last of all the women. Mm -hmm. This world and the hereafter. So we don't deny that Maryam السلام, had an impeccable position as per Surah 3 verse 42 and the famous eye of her being chosen by Allah. But when Fatima Zahra comes, you find that she is seen as being the highest of the figures. The greatest of the women. And this is attested to in all the schools of the religion of Islam. SubhanAllah. So being such a great woman, having such a status, how was her relationship with her father, the Holy Prophet salam, in terms of obviously at the beginning of the message of Islam, he went through a lot of grievances, a lot of problems, wars, people mocking him, etc. How did she deal with that growing up, obviously losing her mother at a young age also? Well, if he's talking about Ummu Abiha, as he mentioned so many mm -hmm. times, that she's the mother of her father, I don't think you can get an accolade as wonderful as that. But even more beautiful is for him to say that she's a part of me. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's not just, we're not talking just a physical part. This is the continuation of the Abrahamic light. Shi'i imamology and authority is not simply discussing Arabic personage. Some people try and think that Tashayyur is this discussion of a group of Arabic personalities or a family. No. The mystical divine covenant where God wanted the light of Abraham to continue in the loins of particular chosen people. Allah said in the last of Adam wa Nuh wa Al Ibrahim, the family of Abraham were chosen, members of them, not those who perform volm. Mm. Rather, those who were the very embodiment of justice and dignity and mercy and the manifestation of God's attributes on earth. When Rasulullah says, Fatima bada'atun minni, it's like when he says, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. It's not a physical thing. There is actually a continuation of the message. The understanding of the Lord continues from Rasulullah to his daughter Fatima. The way to speak about the Lord continues from Rasulullah to his daughter Fatima. 
But when you're mentioning those early days, they're very difficult for Rasulullah. When she's born, he's in the middle of the most difficult, turbulent period of his life. And she has to witness unbelievable amounts of oppression against him. Famous ayah in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ara'ayta alladhi yanha abdan idha salla. Have you seen the one who disrespects our servant while he's in his prayer? Abu Jahl, as the viewers all know, Abu Jahl used to throw feces on the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Who is it that used to clean that feces but Fatima? You find, for example, that when Umm Jamil, the wife of Abu Lahab, used to throw stones at Rasulullah, who would clean the injuries but Fatima? But I don't want Fatima to be known as great simply because she's the daughter of so-and-so or the mm. wife of so-and-so or because she cleaned her dad's wounds and injuries. There are many girls who've had to see their fathers oppressed. There are many out there who have defended their parents when their parents have been oppressed. There are many out there whose fathers have said, oh, if it's not for that daughter of mine, I would be no one. Many have received similar accolades, say Jabbar. I can't sit here and say that Fatima al-Zahra is amazing because of this, because you and I both have heard our dads mm -hmm. have in one way or the other praised our own sisters like this. But there are other traditions which highlight to you who Fatima is in terms of her closeness to Allah, not whose daughter or whose wife mm. she is. There are many, when they begin their lectures, when they talk about the greatest woman in Islamic history, and that is Fatima Zahra. Whenever they talk about her, they're like, Fatima Zahra is great because she's the wife of Imam Ali. Mm. Or do you know whose daughter she is? She's the daughter of Rasulullah. <laughs> yes, and that's great by default. That's not great because you've actually achieved anything. That's by default. You happen to be born in the right place at the, at the right, right time. time. Yeah. Now, of course, even the, on the previous nights where you mentioned the hadith of Imam Sadiq salam, gathering his family around and saying to them, don't think that just because you're related to me or you, you share blood with me on the Day of Judgment, you're going to get a free pass. So, of course, even the ayah in the Quran, chapter 49, verse 13 of, of uh, you know, God only judges with impiety. Also, of course, it's, exactly. it's down to what you the, achieve the, the real, yourself. The real Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, there are lines where the Holy Prophet highlights what position she has in the eyes of God. And there are lines where the Imams highlight. When the Holy Prophet, for example, says, Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Ya Allah. That means that to anger Fatima is the same as angering Rasulullah. Angering Rasulullah is the same as angering who? Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you agree? Of course. That means that the pleasure of Fatima is the pleasure of Allah. The anger of Fatima is the anger of Allah. Tell me how many people did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his lifetime ever say? Whoever angers them, angers me. You can't find that tradition about five people, 50 people, 100 people. Al-Muhammad, you'll find those traditions about them. When you're looking at him saying something like, Fatima's a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me. That's the first indicator. When everybody comes to propose for her, when they want to get married, Rasulullah later talks about the idea that if it's not for Ali, there's no one who would be anywhere near Fatima. What's he saying there? He's saying that all those who have come to propose, they may believe in God and so on, but that's not enough for you to even come near Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Fatima's cognizance of her Lord and the way her Lord has poured grace and showered his grace over her. There's only one man who she can ever marry. Mm. And that's probably the only man in Arabia at the time and the only creation alongside her dad who's greater than her. And that's Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam.
we recognize that Rasulullah and Imam Ali are the two greatest creations of God. Mm. Fatima and Zahra cannot be with anyone else. Others can come and propose all day long. Thirdly, with the event of Mubahala, there are many women who are around. And the Quran tells the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, in Surah 3, verse 61, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ The Quran says, those who dispute with you after the knowledge has come to them, tell them you bring your sons, we'll bring our sons. Bring your woman, we'll bring us. Tell me, with all of these women present, hmm. Rasulullah decides that take Fatima. Why Fatima? Because the best to represent the religion of Islam is Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. It's not because she's my daughter. The verse did not say bring your daughters. It said bring your woman. Hmm. He could bring any of his wives. There's a number of wives who are alive at that time he could have bought. There are a number of wives of Sahab of Rasulullah he could have bought. But he decides the best of the woman to represent. And all of this is captivated in that wonderful sermon that she gives, which people refer to as Al Khutbah Al Fadakiyah, mm -hmm. the Fadak sermon. Fadak sermon. You know what's special about the Fadak sermon? Put everything aside. The way she describes God is unreal. As in it, it deserves 50 lectures, 100 lectures, just on the introduction. Mm -hmm. There's something about Imam Ali Nabi Talib and Fatima Zahra salam, which is unique and which is the bedrock of Shiism, and that is their understanding of their Lord is above any creation that was around them. Mm -hmm. And mind you, if you're raised by Rasulullah, you'd expect that. But the way she talks at the beginning of that khutbah, highlights what Fatima is. Not the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or the wife of Ali. In her own right, she is a very special figure. And that's why today when millions come to remember Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, I'm saddened when I hear people saying, you know how great Fatima Zahra is? She's the daughter of Rasulullah. So what? What of Fatima Zahra sayings? Have you ever heard her explain the Quran? The woman used to go and learn the Quran from her. Even Sami Allah liman hamida. We all know it. After Ruku' Sami Allah liman hamida, we all recite it. She used to give a tafsir. What is the meaning of those words, Sami Allah liman hamida? I didn't even think a lecture could be given about that word. But subhanallah. And others used to come and they used to ask her questions because they believed that's not just the daughter of so and so. That personality is the most perfect, holistic, rounded figure you'll find in her knowledge, perfection. In terms of her manners, perfection. Her son tells her, Mama, I hear you praying for the neighbors, mm -hmm. the community. And she would reply with that line that we all use until today, Al Jar, Thummadar, your neighbors, and then your house. And even the way Imam Ali السلام, talks about her highlights to you just what a special person she was. You know, a flower came from heaven, went to heaven, left its fragrance in my mind. You know, it's, it's, it's this really romantic but, but unbelievable thing that Ali ibn Rattab is distraught when she dies. You know, she, she's given him four wonderful kids. But at the same time, he found a partner to open up to. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he found someone who was always there for him whenever he was facing the harshest moments. Uhud, 63 wounds on his body. Mm -hmm. She doesn't come out and say, hey, you know what? I'm the daughter of so-and-so. I don't clean anyone and I will not help anything. No, no. She comes with the most beautiful Beautiful humility, like the rest of those ladies on the day of Uhud. Mm. So let's not narrow Fatima Zahra down her greatness because she's the daughter or wife of someone. No, no, in her own right, that cognizance of the Lord, which 
Her mother Khadija was impeccably showing when she was living. But in her own right, there is a uniqueness to it. Inshallah. Having such a status within Islam, being known for herself rather than her lineage, her father, her husband, etc. What lessons do you think our younger sisters could take from her life as an example, from her modesty, from her teaching, from her socioeconomic works, from her sermons? Where would you recommend that a sister or even a brother listening now should go and start to try and better understand who she truly was and what she truly meant to the Muslim Ummah? I think firstly, approachability. I think that's something missing in our communities today. And I think with Father Zara السلام, everybody found that she was approachable. Mm -hmm. Now someone might say, hold on, let's talk about her knowledge, let's talk about this. No, no. Simple approachability. This is the daughter of the man seen as God's greatest creation and his final messenger. She could easily have stiff upper lip, arrogant, you can't come talk to me, I don't know you. Don't come talk to us if you're not at this level or you're not Book from this family or you're, you know, we have chavs out there like that. Now, with Fadl Zara there's an unbelievable approachability. When you look at the way people talk about someone, those who've lived with them, those who've seen them in their most difficult moments, you realize what they are. You look at the way Sayyid Fadl talks about Fadl Zara that she would tell me, Fadl, go rest, today's my day. Tell me today, <laughs> I can't imagine someone from a massive, you know, well-known royal family out there. I can't imagine them saying to one of their servants, you know, they have many of these servants, they bring from the Far East, Philippines and Malaysia, Indonesia. Sometimes they bring from Bangladesh. And you see them sometimes you know, running after their fat kids. These guys can produce a football, not a child. It's a, it's a round ball that's walking <laughs> on the earth. And, and you see these poor Far Eastern servants picking them up. Well, I can't pick up someone like that. I'll break my back, sincerely. Mm -hmm. And yet you'll see them picking up these. Now, being mistreated by the kids often being mistreated, as well. The or kid recently they showed one king of one particular and... royal family in the Middle East. Mm -hmm who was beating everybody around him. You know, Arab Bedouin is a Bedouin. They remain a dog forever. But when you're looking at Fatima Zahra salam, for her, she is the royalty of this religion. Mm -hmm. But she tells someone like Sayyid the father don't worry. Today is my day. Believe you me, there are those out there who do majalis in the honor of Fatima Zahra. They'll have a servant at home. You can never, never will they imagine, listen, that you are going to do it one day and I'll do another. No, impossible. Mm -hmm. Some don't even let them come near them and sit in their gatherings or eat on the same table. Fatima is Zahra alayhi salam's approachability is something wonderful. Because you can have all the knowledge in the world, but not an approachable person. Abrasive, foul mouth. But when Fatima Zahra السلام, has all of that, yet Sayyid of Fidda, Asma bint Umais, look at the way she, you know, glosses on the life of Fatima Zahra السلام, and constantly in praise of her behavior and her humility. Mm -hmm. That lady who came to ask Fatima Zahra a question about Salah, and I've, I've had these moments where someone says, can I just ask you one question, Sayyidina? And you're like, yeah, yeah, sure. About... 25 minutes later, everybody's asked about 40, 50 questions. Uh, and then someone says, those guys myself. Uh, <laughs> Come up to you, say, no, can you answer this? Yeah. <laughs> so I think when that happens, that lady realizes that I've asked a few questions too many. And she says, I'm sorry that I've asked that many questions. And then she replies with this unbelievable reply. She says that... If, Allah, if someone said to you that if you carry something to the top of that mountain, they'll pay you this many dinar, for example, mm -hmm. would you do it? said, yes. said, Allah will reward me with a lot more thawab for answering these questions. In our communities today, sometimes when a revert joins our community, sometimes the approachability factor hurts them mm -hmm. because they look around and they're wondering, 
you know what, I can't really see anyone who's looked at me in a way where they've said, you know what, come welcome, come sit mm. with us. And we actually have groups in the Muslim community where if you want to be part of that group, they've got to first rubber stamp you before you can come and sit in their mm. gatherings. And this happens with the brothers and the sisters. Both who claim to love Fatima Sarah salam. That you know what, I see someone new. I don't go up to them and say, how are you? What's your name? I've not seen you before. Is there any way we can help you and your family? Approachability, she's unique in. Secondly, speaking out against the injustice of her time. She could have remained silent. She said that Nisal Alameen, me and you have just discussed this. But she speaks louder than the other three. This is something unique. Sayyidah Khadija spoke out against, but in her own unique Sayyidah Khadija, very, mm. you know, royal-like manner. Mm. And Maryam, in her own way, tried to speak out against the arrogance of some of the clergy of her time. Asiya, it was a one-on-one -on -one battle in reality mm. with Pharaoh. Fatima Zahra, no, I'll take on the establishment. I'm not scared. At the Today, many of our daughters, yeah. Young age as well. Fatima young age, 18 years A lot years of old. people don't realize that yeah. they think maybe she was 50, 60, 70, 18 years old. At that young age. Old. Today, many of our daughters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them, our sisters, our mothers, they're living at a time where it's so difficult to keep your hijab mm. in terms of your social modesty and in terms of your physical modesty, the khimar, the head covering. Mm. It's so difficult. It really is. For people like myself to come here and sit down and say, oh, you know what? All the sisters should be wearing their head coverings. It's easy. It's not easy. It's difficult times. But it's at times like this where you hold on to Fatima. Mm. Because she saw a certain oppression take place where all of a sudden the pre-Islamic Arabian culture of woman not inheriting was now back. It was back. The Arab Bedouins were now in power. Mm. And she could easily stay quiet. But no, I'm not going to stay quiet. I'm going to speak out against injustice. Because if injustice anywhere, as Luther King used to say, is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Is a threat to justice everywhere she would not remain silent and that brings the anger of those at that time mm. i'm not surprised when i read in sahih al-bukhari certain narrations which mention that she wanted a secret burial she did not want certain people at her funeral because she saw that i spoke out against your oppression but what you did back to me One was it's verbal, the biggest sign of hypocrisy. The other physical. So, these two lessons, one a very akhlaqi type lesson, mm. another one a more social reform type standard that she sets, I think these are two wonderful lessons that we can benefit from her. Inshallah. So well, what is the reason that, that her burial site is, is hidden out of interest? Well, it's a difficult political time after, after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family dies. And I think anyone who out there tries to gloss over this and say everything was rosy. Well, you know, it's, it's their day of judgment. I, I don't want to... I don't want to sit here and say that... that they're covering the facts, mm -hmm. but I find it amazing that in the books of all Muslims, it mentions who she died angry with, who she didn't want at her funeral, and that she wants a secret burial. And you'll still find Muslims out there will say that, you know what, nothing really happened. People have disagreements. What did I say early on the show? I said, the Quran said some messengers excel above others, some prophets above others. Why? The Quran doesn't need to say this. I also said that the moment the Quran is saying this, it's giving us an indication that our theologies are built around these mm. principles. And that if the Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon his family, says, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me. 
These are all indicators. Do you know that there were people who knew that it was such a powerful indicator? They started fabricating nonsense that the hadith Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her angers me, is because Imam Ali angered Fatima to Zahra That Imam Ali supposedly went to propose for Juwayriya, the daughter of Abu Jahl. And in so doing, what about the ayah and the anger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And mind you, if you look at the chain of the narrators of that tradition, some of Ali ibn Abi Talib's greatest enemies are all, subhanallah, in one chain. <laughs> but when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers, angers me. Theology is built on this because he's no longer saying my daughter. Mm-hmm. Now it's, and whoever angers me, angers Allah. So for someone to come and tell me, well, Fatima being angry after Rasulullah died, wallah, sometimes you hear the following, listen to the following mm. reasons. I've got to mention them on air. Sometimes you hear people saying, oh, she died because of depression. <laughs> listen, we've all, we've all had difficult times, mm. but I don't think it necessarily led to our deaths. And you're telling me, the part of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who her anger is anger of Allah dies of depression. Then there's others who are like, well, you know what? She was in a state of grief, but nothing much further. No, no, there are clear traditions that there was an intention to attack the house of Fatima. Some say, but they didn't, did they, didn't they? The names of those involved speak for themselves. Mm. You've got to be someone who doesn't know the biographies for you to provide a defense for those who are involved. Mm. Because some of these guys came to Islam by slapping their sisters. Others of them have a track record of killing women. Others are from tribes such as Thaqif and Hawazin and Makhzum. These are vicious animal tribes who produce some of the most barbaric people. So yeah, it's it's an extremely sensitive issue. And uh, some would ensure that it shouldn't be narrated uh, because of its sensitivity and because of the bad light it puts certain supposedly great personalities in. Of course. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Inshallah, we'll be back after a short break where we'll be taking your questions. This could be questions on the topic we've discussed uh, tonight, on the issues that we've already mentioned and discussed tonight also. Or these could be general questions that you'd like me to put towards uh, Sayyid Ammar Nakshwani, who is with us tonight. You can send in your questions via the WhatsApp number or call in live for the number provided on the screen or send in your messages through Facebook. Uh, once again, we'd like to congratulate you on the auspicious birth of Sayyidina Masoom alayhi salam and we'd like to see you again after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining us once again for Live in London with Dr. Said Amman Akshwani, where tonight we're discussing and looking into the topic of the greatest woman in Islam. For the first half of the show, for the viewers who missed it, we discussed four of the greatest women in Islam as per our narrations within Shia and other sects' books. And we looked into the greatest woman in the history of Islam, Fatima al Zahra. For this part of the show, we'll be carrying on with this discussion as well as taking your calls uh, via the number on the screen, which is 07939-917-163. We look forward to hearing from you, inshallah. You can call in the studio and put your questions direct to Dr. Said Ammar himself. Alternatively, you can send in your questions with your name and your location via WhatsApp or send them in on Facebook via the comments or messages list. Sayyidina, we have a a question that's come in during the break uh, from Brother Amir Ali from London. He's asking, what is Fatima's mashaf and who holds it? Yes, the mashaf of Fatima brings about a lot of controversy because people assume when they hear the 
word Mas'haf, they assume that it's the Qur'an of Fatima. And that couldn't be further from the truth. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died, as a form of consolation, a form of consoling Fatima to Zahra, because of that sadness that had enveloped her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would provide her through the dictations of the angel. In the same way Maryam received from Jibra'il. Likewise, Fatima is a muhaddatha. And that this particular book, the Mas'haf of Fatima, is seen as being three times the length of the Holy Quran, three times the size of the Holy Quran. But it doesn't contain a single verse from the Holy Quran. Rather, it talks about events that are to happen at the present and at the future and different types of knowledge which is given to Ahl al-Bayt and the person who helps as the scribe with this is Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and this remains with Al-Muhammad So the current holder would be Imam Mahdi uh, Sister Raqayya from Dearborn says Why does Hadith al-Kisar start with Hazrat Zahra alayha, and not the Prophet first if he was the best of creation? Even if it starts with Fatima Zahra, it's not contradictory. Uh, you know, people try and say that, well, because Rasulullah is not the one where it says, Hum Muhammad, for example, and his daughter and his son-in-law and his grandchildren, therefore, does it mean that Fatima Zahra is greater? Not at all, no. <coughs> okay. That section refers to Fatima Zahra and then her father. And then it refers to her husband and then to her sons. And here there is no contradiction in trying to mention that, oh, because it says Hum Fatima, mm. that means Fatima is greater than anyone else then, not at all. Rasulullah remains the greatest, Ali ibn Abi Talib after him. Okay, thank you, Sayyidina. Uh, <laughs> Brother Irtiza from Pakistan, why has a woman been put subservient or secondary to men in a lot of aspects, e.g. the wife must obey her husband? in laws of inheritance and even in value of testimony. The world is moving towards equality, but Islam doesn't seem to support this idea. What would you respond I to I wouldn't that? generalize and say that Islam doesn't support this idea or that Islam has not sought to look at how laws are to be applied in relation to the time and the space and the context in which they're revealed. Let me explain. When brother is mentioning about these particular laws in relation to woman, when the religion of Islam comes towards the Arabs in that period, their treatment of the woman is barbaric. Mm. Some of them decide to bury their daughters alive. When they bury their daughters alive, it's because of three reasons. Either because they are scared their daughters may run away with someone from a different tribe. Or they think their daughters cannot help them in the battlefield. Or they think their daughters will not be good businesswomen. Mm -hmm. So some of them would come and bury their daughters alive. If you want, you can look in the Quran, Surah 16, verse 58 to 59. Or you look at the famous ayah of the Quran, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ The female baby will ask on the Day of Judgment, for what reason was I buried alive? Woman, these girls were being buried alive, number one. Number two, the brother saying, Islam is not respecting the woman in terms of inheritance. For the woman to inherit, firstly, in some countries took years much later than the religion of Islam. Mm. In Arabia, women had, forget inheriting. They were inherited. I'll give you an example. My dad... He's married to my mom. My mom dies. He marries a second woman, yes? When he dies, I inherit her. I inherit my stepmother. That would used to happen in Arabia. So you'd have to marry her? No, you inherit her. She's, she's yours. She's yours. <laughs> okay. The stepmother has no option. She becomes yours. Wow. What about mahram, no mahram? Halal, haram. Well, mahram and na mahram, halal and haram, these are all Islamic laws. We're talking jahiliyyah. Yeah. So, when you're looking at this, you're finding that the woman, mahar, dowry. 
Today the dowry is given in those days. Father-in-law takes the dowry. Women who are married, if their husband decides, you know what, I don't like this relationship, I'm just going to walk away. My dear brother, Irtiza, I think his name was. Irtiza from Pakistan. When you're telling me about the laws that Islam instituted, first, look at the situation and the context of how these laws came. The first part of the answer is that Islam came to try and bring, Wallah, I have read people who have written articles proving that the greatest feminist in the history of the world was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Now, because when they see the reforms that he instituted mm -hmm. in, a, in a society that barbarically treated women, I'm not going to say that those reforms we're going to bring an ideal straight away. Mm. And I'm also going to throw the spanner in the works by saying that I think if the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family looked at us today, he would ask us that I would have thought you people would have continued With in looking at teachings. the rights of what we had established and worked harder on establishing it more. Mm. But that's not to say, that's not to say that Islam should be embarrassed by its record. Muslim countries have had presidents or prime ministers who are women. Mm. United States of America until today has not had a leader of the country who's a woman. Mm. Pakistan can turn around and say we have. Bangladesh can turn around and say we have. And most people view Pakistan, Bangladesh as third world countries. Tell you mm. what, a woman got to the top. If the woman were so oppressed in early Islam, Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, would not be able to lead an army of thousands of men to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib at the Battle of the Camel. Mm. If women were confined to houses and women were ordered that all you can be is servants, all you do is cook and clean. How does Aisha have the ability? The wife of Muhammad, therefore she is seen as being one who represents some of the vision of the Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace be upon his family. She struts on her camel, sitting there, relaxed, with thousands of men around her. And you say Islam is a religion that has not given rights. How many women are there that when a religion is 25, 30 years of age, are able to lead that much men and be revered and respected so highly that even if she does do that and raises an army, you can't say a single word about it. And then when you bring in me other issues like inheritance, look at the context. And the idea of the breadwinner at that time was the man. Therefore, the inheritance would be higher because the man is the one who's seen as the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. The man's the one seen who has to spend. The right of the woman is that she doesn't have to work a single day on her life. That wife, her husband has to spend completely on her. If you're telling me about witnessing, the verse on witnessing is a verse in reference, for example, to an issue of a financial dispute or transaction. One witness comes to help the other. This is not an easy issue. So it's not just simple for a person to say everybody's moved on. No, everybody has not moved on. The United Kingdom and the United States, only in the 20th century, only in the 20th century were there movements to tell women, okay, maybe you can vote. Mm. And there are many women who lost their lives or who were mocked. And yet Islam many years back had women leading armies or women speaking out against oppression. In their time. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that the application of some of these laws is in the hands of a, sometimes a chauvinistic, patriarchal, male, arrogant society. Mm -hmm. I can't deny that. I can't deny it. Nor can I deny the fact that a jurist who leads a religion who's seen his wife or his daughters live in a certain way I find it difficult to see how they can appreciate that others may also be spiritually high without living in the same 
prototype that they mm. live in or expect of. That's a debate in itself. That when a person provides you with laws in a particular religion, how much of their worldview has an effect on the law that they formulate? 0.01%? Mm. Even that's a lot. Of course. So, no, we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Please, could you state your name and location and your question to Dr. Sayyid Ammar? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sayyid Murtaza al Husseini. I'm calling from Cricklewood. And my question for the Sayyid is this We have a hadith, a very known hadith, it's said on the member a lot, that Rasulullah said to Imam Ali, If it wasn't for me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have created you. And if it wasn't for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have created me. And if it wasn't for Fatima the Zahra, He wouldn't have created neither of us. But they said, please expand on this hadith. Thank you very much. Thank you. The narration. Well, this hadith, I think, is one of the narrations that highlights to us that divine, mystical, Abrahamic light mm. that continued in the loins of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the great Abu Talib alayhi salam. Mm. It wasn't just a matter of Arabs who were becoming leaders of a religion. Rather, it was part of a divine covenant. Mm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was also showing us that in reality, these three, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Ali and Fatima, are the greatest teachers that I have created, if ever you want to understand my religion or my, religion, or anything, yeah. my existence and the mercy that surrounds you. And believe you me, subhanAllah, when you look at a sermon like al Khutbah al-Fadaqiyah of Fatima Zahra or a dua like the supplications of Ali, you'll find that if you want to know God, there is no one better than the triumvirate the triumvirate of Muhammad, Ali and Fatima. Mm. So therefore, when we read narrations like this, or read a narration like Imam al-Askari's narration, we are a hujjah on the people and Fatima is a hujjah on us. Such narrations highlight to us that the very depths of knowledge in this religion and the foundations of this religion lie with Rasulullah, with Fatima Zahra and with, no doubt, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Uh, we have another question. Uh, re this question is uh, from Sister Hajir from London. Uh, regarding the verse in the Quran, Allah doesn't burden a soul except that which it can bear. Can it be applied to life's difficulties or only to the struggles that sometimes comes with performing religious actions in Islam, such as prayer, fasting, hijab? I think even if you're looking at the acts of worship, even them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us with a means of still being able to perform them in moments of difficulty. I tell you even now if I'm on a plane. And while I'm on that plane, I'll be like, well, you know what? I'm not going to pray on this plane because Allah doesn't burden us all with that which I can handle. And if I pray on this plane, then, you know, some people might mock me or might abuse me if I stand up and go and stand near the bathroom and mm -hmm. do it. In the laws you find that, okay, stay sitting in your seat and face the direction that's in front of you, for example, if you don't know the direction of the Qibla. So even in those situations where man sometimes begins to use that verse for their own... <laughs> Selfish desire. Selfishness sometimes. <laughs> that, you know what, Allah doesn't burn us all that which you cannot handle, therefore I'm not going to do this. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us with different avenues in which we are able to reach him, in which we are able to communicate to him, in which the religion came to bring ease and not hardship. Mm. Therefore, sometimes also don't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather look at yourself. Allah has set a principle subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I'm not going to burden a soul with that which you're going to handle. Therefore, the situation that you're in, first ask yourself, how did you get into that situation? Mm -hmm. Don't blame me. Secondly, how can you get yourself out of the situation? You'll find the answers. Thirdly, learn the lessons from that situation. Mm -hmm. But there's no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would break that principle. No way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never place on me a burden 
which I cannot handle. It goes against the very foundations of justice. Mm. Thank you, Sayedna. Uh, this one is from Saudi Arabia, from Sister Eliza. My question is, how shall Muslim women react or what shall they do when they find out their spouses are not sincere with them and mistreat their wives? This has become a very common issue today and would like to know what Muslim women should do in order to save their marriage. Is getting divorced the only solution when such issues arise? No, I think, I think getting divorced is the final solution. I think if there are issues between the husband and the wife, always the people of wisdom should be brought into the issue. If we're talking, it's reached a very difficult stage. At the beginning, now you talk between yourself. You talk between yourself, you change the environment you're in, maybe go on a holiday together, spend time together. Many brothers and sisters do not realize that when they get married and there's kids right at the beginning of that marriage, there's extreme difficulties physically and emotionally for especially the mother in the relationship and also there's now different responsibilities that have come about and now there is less time and things are not as rosy as that engagement period was. Therefore, in this situation, a person shouldn't just say, well, you know, I'm getting frustrated with life, that's it, I want to get rid of this. But rather, maybe change environment, maybe go to pastures new, maybe change scenery and then one could go to the people of Wisdom, sit with them. You know, subhanAllah, sometimes, however much we think we know, when we speak to those who have wisdom, be they younger than us or be they older than us, they open for us an angle none of us can imagine. Especially those who have traveled the earth and have seen many different situations and many different stories. Therefore, if you find, for example, that your husband, let's say, has been insincere, don't hide it for a long time. Sit with them. Bring up the issue. Talk with each other in a respectful manner. And let the person know your feelings and hear what their feelings are. I'm not going to make an excuse for them, but hear what they've got to say. Maybe on your side, maybe on your side there are things which you didn't notice. Remember, a believer is a mirror to their fellow believer. And the two have to be mirrors to one another. The husband may not realize that his behavior, what it's doing to you, and you may not realize that sometimes some of the decisions that you're making may also be bringing a certain disturbance to the relationship. But don't straight away decide that we're just going to end this. And also at the same time, be careful whose advice that you take. So if you're, if you're going to take the advice of someone who is not necessarily seen as a person of wisdom, mm. Or someone who themselves may have a certain jealous streak. They want to see you break up because they're jealous of you. But they'll say, you know what? It's better that you break up because they hate the world. They want you to also hate the world too. Be careful. Don't just listen to anyone out there. There are people of wisdom who you can sit with. And also, if now after the people of wisdom haven't done or haven't reached a solution, maybe a period of separation is healthy. Why straight away we should sign papers of divorce? There are times when papers of divorce are needed. Let's be clear. There are certain disgusting acts that can occur mm. where there should be a breakup. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not said there's no divorce in Islam. The worst of the halals, but it's allowed. But sometimes a period of separation makes the absence, makes the heart grow fonder. These are all things that should be taken on board because there are many who may have got divorced who regret their divorces. Mm. And I think it's vital for us that maybe periods of separations where you see whether there's still something there. Imam Amir al muminin even has traditions where he tells the men of the community that make a hundred excuses for your wife. Now you look at traditions like that and you're wondering why is he saying something like that? But then there are traditions which also say things like, for example, things along the lines of a uh, uh, husband has the right to choose his wife's friends. You see some of our sisters, for example, they say that we want to make sure that we quote all the traditions that suit us. Mm. But then if there's a tradition that suits the brothers, like, no, no, I don't want to hear that tradition. Ahlul Bayt have made it clear marriage is really a struggle. 
When you hear people like the Imam saying, the jihad of the wife, not the battlefield. Mm -hmm. It's having good manners with the husband. It's a struggle. Because when you're showing the best of manners, you're saying you're seeing nothing reciprocated. It's a struggle. And there is no great personality but that they had tests in their marriage. Imam al-Hassan never had a test in his marriage. Imam al-Jawad did not have a test in his marriage. Nabi Ibrahim did not have a test in his marriage. Nabi Nuh did not have a test in his marriage. Many will have tests in their marriage. And we'll have this discussion coming soon. Inshallah. About marriage and divorce and Islam and so on. But please, my dear brothers and sisters, the people of wisdom do not neglect them. Sometimes a word with a wise member of the community can go a long way. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Sayyidina. Uh, another one from uh, Brother uh, Intizar uh, from Pakistan. I think is a good question, hence I'm using, sure. using him twice. Uh, he says, Islam preaches us to stay united, but at the same time we have to tell our generations that about the injustices caused by those revered by members of the other sects. How do we draw the fine line between maintaining unity along with telling history to our younger generations? Unity, unity is not that I hide what I believe in. Mm. It's that I recognize that there are others who may have reached different conclusions to me. I can still give lectures. I, I remember there was a certain time in, uh, in the Iraqi community in London. I remember when I was lecturing maybe about 12 years ago where people were saying that, you know, don't mention too much about Imam Ali and Ghadir and Jamal and Saqifa and you know try and you know, let's talk more let's bring more unity and I did used to wonder at the time that you know maybe they're right maybe we don't need to talk this much about our mm -hmm. beliefs then I realized no you talk about your beliefs openly but you recognize that there may be others who differ with you there are others who've taken different theological paths to you there are others who drink from tap water while you drink from Evian. You know, you, you got to appreciate that these things happen. So, secondly, I think trying to maintain as much Akhlaq respect as you can. while you're talking about certain sensitive issues, as difficult as it may be when you talk about these tragic moments in Islamic history. But now, for example, in the UK, myself, other lecturers, we've had our times where we've debated issues within our communities. We've had our times where we've discussed many sensitive issues. But I think it's very important with Islam under so much attack at the moment that the Muslims try and find ways of working together and that these theological issues can be discussed with respect and in different circles, in the right time, in the right place. And with qualified people, obviously, Inshallah, as well. Yes. Inshallah. Uh, Sister Mina from London, she's asking, why is nothing ever spoken about the plight of the Prophet's daughter, Sayyid Ruqayya bint Rasulullah? About Sayyid Ruqayya? Sayyid Ruqayya bint Rasulullah is what she's asking about. The plight of Ruqayya, the daughter of Rasulullah? That's what I have on the screen. Ruqayya, the daughter of Rasulullah, I don't see, I don't see why it would be a plight. You know, these, you know, these, these daughters were, the plight that one may argue is that originally they were married to Abu Lahab's two sons, Utbah and Utayba, and then later on Abu Lahab orders them to get divorced. Um, but in terms of plight that happened to them, I don't know, Ruqayya, daughter of Imam al Hussein, we can certainly talk about plight, but Ruqayya, daughter of Rasulullah, you know, she, she lives what any other Muslim lives. Um, there's you know, not much in the way of plight there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sayyidina. Uh, Saif Ali from Mumbai is asking, a bit off topic, uh, he's asking how can he increase his concentration while performing Salah? Not easy. Not easy, and I'm no one to talk about that because it's not like I've achieved perfection in concentration and salah. 
there's always the odd time when you're thinking, where am I going out? What meeting do I have? What's the score at the football match that I was watching? It's not easy. But there are certain things which I believe that I may have seen that have helped me in certain instances. First and foremost, trying to pray somewhere which is a bit quieter. You know, a room which is dedicated as a salah room, going to the mosque, that has a major effect. You're going to start, stand, you know, you're going to pray standing next to the World Cup final on TV. Half your eyes are going to be looking at the TV screen. But if you can have a room in the house which is dedicated to praying, or you can find a, so, a quieter spot, or you can go to the local mosque every once in a while and pray your prayers, that's one thing. Secondly, every meal requires starters. Salah requires starters as well. For example, a person reading a bit of Qur'an before they begin, doing some istighfar before they begin, that can help. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, not always reciting قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَادُ or إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَارُ after Surah Al-Fatiha. Try and change it up a bit. Try and read Surah Al-Nas. Try and read Surah Al-Falaq. Try and read, for example, Surah Al-Qadr. Try and read Surah Al-Muzzammin, Surah Al-Kafirun. These have many rewards. Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah, if you go to Hajj or Umrah, <laughs> you're going to have to listen to Surah Al-Baqarah, certainly when you're, when you're praying. But try and change up the Surah, inshallah. That's something. In Qunut, not the same dua all the time. Many times you hear people recite the same dua, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana. Mm. Or sometimes, you know, Rabbi khfir li wali wali. Try and change it. Allahumma kun li walika. Allahumma khfir li al-mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib al qulub In your sujood, change up the last part. Not always, Ya Latif, Arham, Abdika al-Dhaif. Or Ya Wali al-Afiya, Asaluka al-Afiya. Sometimes, Allahumma anni asaluka al-Rahata anda al-Mawt, wal-Maghfirata ba'da al-Mawt, wal-Afwa anda al-Hisam. إلهي كفى بي عزنا نكون لك عبدا وكفى بي فخرا تكون لي ربا أنت كما أحب فاجعلني كما تحب اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود وثبت لنا قدم صدقا All of these try and change up the salah Why? Because automatically in your head you're thinking You know what today I'm doing a different surah You're now devoted to Allah سبحانه وتعالى You're thinking about how to talk to Allah And more important than all the other advices I've given Make sure you know the translation of what you're reciting. Mm. Of course. There are many Muslims out there. If you ask them, what does the word Baalin mean? غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Many don't know. There are many, if you ask them, Subhana Rabbi Al A'la and Subhana Rabbi Al Azimi, what's the difference between the two? There are many when they get up from Ruku' Sami Allah liman hamida. Allah is the one who praises him. Many mm. don't say Alhamdulillah. So, Sami Allah, Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. There are many, Ya Latif, Arham Abdik al Da'if, who don't know the translation of that. Then you're just talking Parroting Arabic. Parroting almost. Yeah, just... oscillating tongue mm. movements are happening. Try your hardest, if you can, to try and sit one day and learn the translation of what it is that you're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see the difference it will make. Inshallah. One advice that I got when I asked this question uh, yeah. from a grand ayatollah was, uh, which I think has helped me personally, obviously I'm, I'm your student, but uh, he said, Salah, like you said, has starters also. So he said, right from where you do wudu, think why you're performing the wudu. Mm. So when you wash your face, say, forgive the sins that I did with my eyes. Forgive the, the, for example, the feet that have taken me to sin, etc. Excellent. And from that moment, you get into the sort of... Uh, position to pray and, and, and you're almost ready to, 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 to greet your Lord. So I find that that's always uh, Excellent. helped uh, within, within Salah. Uh, next question, Sayedna, is from Brother Zishan in the United States. Uh, he's asking, because obviously within our religion it's okay to intermarry within cousins. He's asking, due to genetic problems with marrying cousins, is it better to marry outside of the family or within the family? Well, you look in the, in the life of the Ahlul Bayt and you'll find, for example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, one of his marriages is with a cousin, and that is Zainab. Whereas another of his marriages, for example, is with someone like Sayyidah Khadija, who's not a first cousin. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam marries his second cousin, whereas Sayyidah Zainab marries her first cousin. So it's not a rule that you have to marry your first cousins. Mm. 
If you find that there's going to be a medical issue in the family, if you are going to continue marry cousins, your dad married a cousin, your uncle, your granddad married a cousin, if you could see there's going to be a medical issue, then you should not. You should not, yeah. inshallah. Uh, a sister has put a question, uh, since imamat is so fundamental to our beliefs, why is it not mentioned in the Qur'an in clear words? Why does the Qur'an they've written stayed silent or indirected on the topic of imamat? After inshallah, prayer? we have this discussion on Friday. Inshallah. We tell this the viewers on Friday. Friday, join us for the discussion. Well, we'll look at imamah, the discussion of imamah, the meaning of imamah, how to explain imamah, and the discussion of those who say, well, it's not in the Qur'an, how could you have it as a core belief? How do we understand authority? And how do we understand the risala of Rasulullah? What is the imamah of Ibrahim? All of this we'll discuss on Friday's show, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Sayyid Ali from Northampton has kindly messaged uh, saying, since we're on the topic of salah, what are the benefits and what is tasbihat al-zahra? Salaam Allah Well, it seems that from the narrations, the Lady of Light is looking for someone to help her in the house. And that Rasulullah replies to her, I'll give you something which is greater something which is more beneficial to you than any helper who will be with you at home. And that is for you to 34 times say, Allahu Akbar. And 33 times say, Subhanallah. And 33 times say, Alhamdulillah. And that whoever recites the Subhanallah, the plethora of traditions, mm -hmm. which talk about the merits of the Tasbih of Fatwa al-Zahra, Salawatullah wa Salamu alayha. One particular narration, and I can go on and on about the narrations, but one particular narration which always struck me is that whoever finishes their salah and straight away begins with the rosary bead, the recital of the dhikr of the tasbih of Fatwa al Zahra, salam, Allah will not allow them to touch the fire of hell. The fire of hell will never touch them. Sometimes when we finish our salah, Wallah, my dear brothers and sisters, all it takes is just to stay on the prayer mat one or two minutes extra. It makes a whole difference to your day, mm -hmm. your year, your life. And your hereafter. And your hereafter, of course. In your day, you've mentioned 33 times, Alhamdulillah. Alhamd is a form of thanking Allah, is a form of praising Allah. Mm -hmm. And if Imam Sadiq says, if you want blessings to continue and remain in your life, always say Alhamdulillah. Secondly, at the same time, don't just go Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. I've, I've seen people, honestly, and I've been there. It just sounds like I've a been there. monotone word. No, no, you hear them straight after Salah, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Spas, 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 You're thinking, what, what's this person saying? No, no. Subhanallah, say it. Even you know in Salah, mm -hmm. when you recite Qul Hu Allah, Surah Al Ikhlas, mm -hmm. after Surah Al Fatiha, you know you can't say it in one breath. Mm -hmm. You have to cut it. Cut it, break it. Some Qul Hu Allah, Salam, Lamina, Dunna, Dunna, Dunna. No, no. Qul Hu Allah, speak to Allah properly. Likewise, when he says, Spa, 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 What spa? What which spa <laughs> are you referring to? You know? Subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. And say it with full meaning. It's like in Laylatul Qadr when you see people and they're doing the tasbih. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. No, no. Say it to Allah like you mean it. Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa atu. So the other benefit is that you say it in a way where you really are communicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the, the history of it. In Ahlul Bayt, Imam al Sadiq has an unbelievable number of traditions about how this salah is greater than this many rak'ahs, and this mm. salah is greater than this, uh, this tasbih is greater than this salah, than uh, this many salahs, and this many rak'ahs. There's many traditions out there. Inshallah. Sayyidna, thank you very much My for pleasure. the discussion thank tonight. Uh, thank you to our respected brothers and sisters, our viewers. We would like to both, again, congratulate you on the auspicious birth of Hazrat Matsuma, alayhi salam. Our next show, inshallah, will be on Friday evening at 10 p.m. London time, where we will begin by discussing uh, a chosen topic that will be revealed in tomorrow uh, via Facebook, inshallah. 
And uh, for the second part of the show, we'll be answering your general questions uh, with Dr. Said Amman Akshwani. As always, thank you for joining us. Inshallah, we look forward to seeing you soon on Friday night. Please keep us in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.